Good morning, everybody. This is the First Century Church in Theodosia, Missouri. We're glad that you're with us this morning. And the first thing that we're going to do today is uh, we're going to open in prayer. Pause that. Father Jesus, we come to you this morning grateful that we have a church to worship in. We thank you, Father, for the learning experiences that we've all been through. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to send some good people to the church. We know that you've taken out all the people who really didn't want to worship. And you've started from scratch. And we thank you for that, Father God. We know that you're going to send everything to us that we need to grow this church. Because this is something that will last until you come to get us. Until we meet you in the air, we will have church Sunday after Sunday. To those who are watching this morning on YouTube, I pray for you. I pray for your situation at home, at work your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that's aggravating you, that has made you angry, whatever situation you're in that seems hopeless, I pray this morning for you. And I lift my hands to the Lord. And I say, those who are watching this morning, Father God, who call upon your name right now, be blessed and highly favored by you. And that all of their needs and their wishes and the things that they just want, Father God, will be supplied by you and only you. We'll give you praise, glory, and honor. We'll give you praise and glory and honor in the good times and in the bad. Father God, sometimes it looks like we've got an impossible task ahead of us. But we know from experience and from your word that you are the God of the universe. And you can do all things. And we can do all things through Christ who lives in us, who strengthens us. We praise you, Father God, this morning in the house. Amen. This morning, we're going to, you know, even though there's just a few of us, we are going to take our time this morning, and we're going to shake hands and hug somebody's neck, and uh, have our sociable time, and then we're going to get right to the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Talk to you this morning and, and ask the question. Ask a very simple question, and it's uh, it should take a very simple answer. But this question was brought to me to, to, uh, late this week, and the Lord asked me, Kevin, how many? Functional, working, loving families do you know? I had to think about it. And I'm going down the list of all the people I know, and I'm thinking, you know, the only functional family I know is my own. Of course, I think Chris is on the right road. Mainly, we're talking about people who are married and have children. Is the family working? We, heard, we hear the expression all the time, well, this is a dysfunctional family. It's dysfunctional. There's, there's too much drama. There's too much fighting going on. Something in the family's not working like it's supposed to work. And 
Today we're going to talk about not 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 so much talk about uh, how families are dysfunctional, but we're going to talk about how to make them functional. Because we can go, I mean, let's let's be honest, we can go down a list of reasons why families are dysfunctional. Well, let's start out this morning with a little bit of scripture, and we'll go from there. I went back to Genesis, and in the, let's see, uh, third chapter, and along about the 16th verse, and it talks about the curse that God gave to women in general. Of course, it was because Eve took a bite of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Now, I want to get this straight with you so that we can all at least start out agreeing on something. The way it was in the Garden was that man was created by God last. He created the sun and the moon and the stars and he divided the earth into uh, lands and seas and he put creatures on the earth and then he decided let us make man in our image. It doesn't say I'm going to make man in my image. God simply says we are going to make God make man in our image. So what does that mean to us? Well, that's proof that God was not the only one that existed at the time. In the very, very beginning, and I don't believe my mind can wrap around when the beginning actually was, because I think God has always been, and we just don't grasp what always been is yet, or forever is yet. God himself, and I'm talking about Jehovah God, says we are going to make God in our image. He's talking about him, he's talking about Jesus Christ, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always been. God did not create Jesus Christ, and he did not create the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's go to this right now. Let me say, just for an example, that I am God. Okay? I've always been God and, you know, I'm, I'm the creator and I'm getting ready to create some big time stuff here. I have words that I speak and I have a spirit because I'm God. God is actually a spirit and this is why that uh, later in the book, uh, we're taught that when we speak to Jehovah God, it's best to talk to Him in the spirit language. So now, I, I, am, I, I don't want to be by myself, and for whatever good reason that God had, His thinking's higher than our thinking, so we don't know the answer to it. But God's decided that he is going to take every word that he speaks and he is going to bring it out of himself and he is going to have a person represent every word that he says. And then he's going to take the spirit that is in him and he is going to have that be a separate person as well. 
Now, does that mean that God is separated from His Word and separated from His Spirit? No. These three are all in one. And if you've ever heard anybody talk about going to heaven, you'll know, especially during Jesse DePlantis' uh, very famous testimony about the trip that he took to heaven, you'll find out that Jesus goes in and out of the Father at will. And so let's just assume for argument's sake that everything that I just said is true. So Jesus Christ, Father Jehovah, the Holy Spirit, were three separate people at the time, already. And they were on the earth before it was created. Because God said, nothing was created without the Word. Nothing. And it also says the Holy Spirit hovered over the earth, over the whole earth. And it was because the Holy Spirit moved in agreement with the Father and by the Father that everything was created. Now I know that's a little hard to understand. But let's just let's just call this good for now and move on. Now, this is interesting. After man was created, God said it's not good for man to be alone. And so he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And while Adam was sleeping, God removed a rib from Adam. And that is true to this day. Women have one more rib than men do. And so God used that rib and created woman which was supposed to be a helpmate to Adam. Women, don't get upset. Don't be upset right yet, because there's more to it. Now, they were living in the Garden of Eden, which was heaven on earth. And since they were made, in God's image, they were as God. Does that mean they were God? No. But that means they had all the favor of God completely, 100%. Anything they ever wanted, anything they ever wanted to know, everything they ever needed was provided to them by God, and they didn't even have to ask. Before they even thought it, God created it for them, for their comfort. He gave them authority over all the animals of the forest and over every living thing. Now, this means, yes, this means that there was no killing. There was no killing done by the animals, believe it or not. Argued by certain circles in the religious community that animal, all animals were vegetarians. All of them. There was no killing at all, not even by the animals. And so this was truly heaven on earth in the garden. And the only rule that God gave to them was to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was a temptation for them. Now you can ask, if it was heaven on earth, why would God even put something there to tempt them? Here's this big, beautiful tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden, and God told them, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Maybe, maybe, 
God had a plan for that tree later on, but we don't know. There had to be a reason why God put the tree in the Garden of Eden in the first place. But it ended up being a temptation for them. Because of the fact that Satan had been kicked out of heaven. There's scripture in here, and I'll put it on the screen. Jesus Christ himself says, I saw Satan hit the ground as lightning. Lightning. That's how fast the Father kicked Satan out of heaven and a third of the angels. So there was already evil on the earth. The Garden of Eden was a protected place. Now Satan disguised himself as a serpent, as a snake. And at the time, snakes had legs. Snakes definitely had legs. And he came up into the tree, and as Eve walked past the tree, the devil, disguised as a snake, tempted her. And I'm going to put this in my own words, but the devil basically said, hey, taste of the tree. Taste of it. It's good. It's good for you. It will open your eyes. And some people think, well, were Adam and Eve blind? No, they weren't blind. When he said it will open your eyes, that means it will open up the knowledge of good and evil. Because they had no idea what evil was. None. And so Eve fell into temptation and she did take a bite of the forbidden fruit. After she did that, she came to her husband Adam and said, look, I ate of the fruit. It's good for you. It will open your eyes and you and I will be as God knowing good and evil. This is what they, this is what they meant by opening the eyes. Opening the eyes. And so Adam did as his wife directed him to do. And of course we know that they realized that they were naked. Nakedness was not a bad thing. Only us look at it now because of the fall of man. Nudity is a bad thing. Now look. They also knew evil. And they also knew about temptation. And they had their eyes open to all evil. Just like God. Just like God. Except now they realize they had made a mistake. That they wish they could have gone back and not done it. Because, quite frankly, I wish I didn't know evil. I wish I didn't have any knowledge of it. That all I knew was good, good, good. And have all of my desires fulfilled by God. All of a sudden God says, Eve, Adam, where are you? He called to them. And they came out. And God says, why are you hiding? He said, because we were naked. Well, God already knew that they had taken a bite from the forbidden fruit. But he asked them, how did you know that you were naked? 
And they said, we ate of the tree. And the first thing they did was this. It says, he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So see, snakes had legs. You notice here that it is obvious that they're playing the blame game. First, Adam says, well, I ate it because the woman told me to. And she deceived me. And then the woman says, I ate it because the snake told me to, and he deceived me. And so they're going down the line until they finally get to the snake who was the problem at the very beginning, and God set a curse on it. So what's the point? What do you think God would have done if Adam would have said, I ate of the tree and it's my own fault. And I pray, Lord, that you forgive me and I repent. What if he just said that? What if when he got to Eve, Eve would have done the same thing? And said, I was tempted by the serpent. But of my own free will, I ate of it. And then I tempted my husband. Forgive me, Lord, I repent. But they didn't do that. They decided to blame one another so that no one would have to take the responsibility. I don't know what would have happened. I do know that we serve a loving, forgiving God. I don't think that things would have ever been the same again, but not to the extreme that we are in today. Not to the extreme that we're in today. Because to tell you the truth, unless you're totally ignoring what's going on in the world and in the news, you know that we are living in a violent world. I mean, big time. Big time. Do you know that as of this morning, and I'm not taking a side road here, I'm just giving you a, an example of how bad the world is. We have illegal aliens coming into this country from Mexico, from Cuba, from all over the place, but mostly from Mexico. And our government has made a deal with Mexico, with their government, saying that no matter what your people do here while they're in the United States, all we'll do is send them back. We won't prosecute them no matter what they do. And so what does Mexico do? They think that's a great deal. Because 
They're getting rid of all their bad people by sending them to the U.S. And so they go from Mexico to the United States. They killed two police officers yesterday. And what has our government done? Nothing except send them back. They were not charged. Oh, of course, they were held for a while. But our government sent them back to Mexico. And so what are they going to do when they get to Mexico? Nothing. They're going to turn around and come back to the United States again. And they're going to keep playing ping pong back and forth until somebody puts a stop to it. It's ridiculous. They're allowed to vote. How are they voting? I was turned down. I'm a, a citizen of the United States. I've been born and raised here all my life. I pay taxes. I vote on a regular basis. And the last election, they wouldn't let me vote because I had moved into a different county 12 miles away. How are these people able to vote? They show them some kind of an ID and they're voting? Are you kidding me? That's just one example of how bad this world has gotten and it stems from right here in Genesis. Now let's talk about what God did to Eve. And we're going to move on because this is important. He says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman I said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of. And he goes on to talk about how the ground will be cursed and he's going to have to work for his food. And that there will be thorns and thistles that grow up amongst the, the good fruit, the good vegetables. And so that's a pretty stiff curse. They went from living in what must have been heaven on earth. Now they got to go out there and work. Now when women are going to give birth in pain. But the important thing here, and why it's so important to this message, is it says, and it says in some other uh, books, uh, other than the NIV, it says, women will lust after their husbands. Now you think that would be a good thing. It would be a good thing for a woman to want their husband. And to want to follow that man. But the curse has greatly increased over the years by our own doing. But skip ahead. Now, does this mean that the man is the ruler over the woman? No. It does not. 
It simply says that she is a helpmate to the man. Now, the other responsibility here is, and, and I'll put it on the screen again, I'll, I'll put the verse on the screen so you can see it. The way God wanted this to work was like this. Jesus created the church, and Jesus loves the church. We are what's called the apple of Jesus' eye. We're his favorite. Because nobody in the world can go to heaven unless they confess that Jesus is Lord. He loves us. He gave his life for us. Jesus says in here in his book that we are to love our wives as Jesus loves the church. In other words, everything a man does during the marriage, he wakes up in the morning, he's happy to see his wife, and everything he does that day, he does with her best interest in mind. He's not selfish. He does nothing for himself. And the woman, when she wakes up in the morning, she looks forward to seeing her wife and her husband. And everything she does during the day, she does with her husband's best interests in mind. She is not selfish. So a marriage is an equal partnership. Now where does it say, what, what, what is the deal with the man being over the woman? Here is what you need to know about this, and I don't care what you've heard from other churches and other pastors. The man is supposed to be the spiritual leader in the home. And when it comes right down to making a decision concerning what God wants, if there is a disagreement about it after talking it over, after praying about it together, the man is supposed to make the final decision. And the woman is supposed to look to the man for that guidance and be pleased that he has made that decision and support that decision. Now, what happens if the man's not a spiritual person? And the woman is the one who goes to church and seeks a good personal relationship with God. She then becomes the spiritual leader in the home. And she is responsible for leading her husband to Christ. And vice versa. If you make the mistake of marrying someone who you are unequally yoked with, which isn't supposed to happen in the first place, it's better for two Christians of the same religion to marry so that you can get rid of this strife right off the bat. You are supposed to teach each other and support each other in trying to save that person. That's what Christ is talking about here. Now there are other things that go on in a home that 
we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about strife. And we're going to talk about how a family, let's just, let's just start out by saying we're Christian people already right when we get married. We're both Christians. We're equally yoked. We've asked God to bring us that perfect person into our life. And we get married. And we decide we're going to have a couple of children together. All kinds of things can happen according to the devil's will. The thing that people do are these. And these are the most common ones that I can think of. Number one, a young couple who gets married for the first time, both have parents. And the parents may not like you. They may figure that the person that you're marrying isn't good enough for you. Or they may find that she or he has faults that they just don't like. There's always going to be something about you that's not going to jive with their lifestyle. And this is what the Lord says about that. I'm going to read this. I know it may, may seem a little out of context, but I, I want you to know this. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he, Jesus, replied to him and said, now he's inside of a house. He's doing some miracles on some people who need healing. There's a crowd in there. It's busy. And Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers and sisters come to where Jesus is at this house. And they knock on the door and they say, we would like to see our son Jesus. And this is what Jesus says. Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Seems like an odd question to ask. Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And who are my sisters? Pointing to the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. God, I love that. How many of us here that are watching this morning can say that they're closer to their Christian friends than they are their blood family. Lots of people can say that. I mean, let's be honest with each other. Most people, whether you're Christian or not Christian, once you get married and you grow up and you move out of the house, you find out that if you don't let your parents talk you into feeling a different way about your spouse, everything would be fine. But no, they got to stick their nose in where don't belong. I made that mistake. Almost every young couple I know about their in-laws. I say 
say to you, Mom and Dad, your children are not your children any longer because they have moved out of the house and according to the will of God, the man and the woman are supposed to cling to one another and become as one. You stop interfering. Now, why is it that we let these parents try to change us, for a lack of a better way to put it? Why don't we just stand up to them and say, hey, that's my wife you're talking about. Or hey, that's my husband that you're putting down. Because they're young and they don't want to disrespect their parents by going against what they're saying. The problem is, is if you let them keep going on and on, you start to believe what they're telling you after a while. You start to see things the way that they see it. Instead of you standing up to them, you let them keep on and on. You gotta stand up. You can do it in a nice way. That doesn't mean you have to get loud and cuss them out and get ignorant about the whole thing. But it means that you better cling to your spouse. Because if you don't, Satan's going to use somebody to get in between you and you will become dysfunctional. I can tell you right now that I wish that I would have told my folks to butt out. But I was young. And I wasn't mature enough because I didn't know my Bible and because I didn't have a relationship with Christ. That's one of the reasons. Another reason was because we're afraid of turmoil. We don't want conflict between us and our parents. That's another reason. We'd rather let things go. Oh, I just ignore them, baby, you know. They don't mean what they say. But let me tell you something. Words can hurt. Words hurt. If you've ever had somebody that was supposed to love you, talk bad about you, it hurts you. We're supposed to just let those things go. Well, it doesn't work that way. These are the stepping stones that start a family in the wrong direction. That's just one thing. But I've never seen it to fail. I've never ever seen both sides of the family agree on anything when it comes to who their son or daughter marry. But you got to start out with enough backbone to say, look, I love you, but this is my marriage and this is my wife. And I love her no matter what you think and I would appreciate it very much if you butted out of our, of our family. Because like the book says right here, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? It's the people who serve God. 
The ones that you see every week at church. They're your brothers. They're your sisters. The older people in the church are your mothers and your fathers. Because the Christian is not supposed to be prejudiced in any way. We are supposed to be encouraging. We learn as we get older to keep our nasty opinions to ourselves. And to there's all kinds of things that can come into your mind, but it's like a big filter up here. You filter all the bad stuff out. You kick it out. And only the good comes out of our mouths. I see dysfunctional families start simply by losing a job. You get married, things are going along pretty good, you're making a good living, and then all of a sudden, three months after you married, you lose your job. The company goes on strike. There's layoffs. And all of a sudden, the future looks dim. And you start fighting amongst each other for money, about money. People start drinking. People start, you know, trying to escape from the garbage that's going on. People can't sleep because they're worried. This is how dysfunctional families start. I'll tell you what hurt me the most. I didn't come up here to talk about me, but I'll tell you what hurts children in the family the most is parents who argue and fight in front of their children. If you're going to have a disagreement, go someplace where the kids cannot hear you or see you. Keep the children out of it. Because it will cause these children to be depressed. They will blame themselves for you fighting. Even if they have no idea why you're fighting, they will blame themselves. And children need to feel secure. They have got to feel that mama and daddy love them and are there for them and will provide for them. And if you're going to fight in front of your kids, that's one of the worst things that a person can ever do in their life. Personally, I am not for hitting children. I'm not. People say, well, you know, it's just my opinion. A lot of people say, well, the kid needed a good beating. Well, maybe they do sometimes. But you better restrain yourself when you do it. There's other ways to discipline a child. You start taking things away from them that they like, and I'll bet you they'll straighten up pretty darn quick. Because there's a lot of things that hurt worse than a whooping. Now, I didn't come here to talk about punishing your kids. But the more hell you put your children through, the more likely it is that when they grow up, they're going to be in a dysfunctional family. What's the answer? If you're in a dysfunctional
dysfunctional family. My God, I can, I can tell you stories. My buddy Chris said that if, if, if he was to get up here and talk about dysfunctional families, he'd have y'all rolling on the floor laughing. I believe you. Because it's been funny, it's comical to watch some of these people. They're lying to each other, they're stealing from each other. They're setting each other up for to have problems. They use each other. I mean, it's horrible some of the things I see going on in families. Horrible. They have drugs, the whole family's on drugs. We had a family up here just about three weeks ago. We're in the paper. They were the mom and the dad and the child were up here at Gainesville High School selling hydrocodone. All the whole family was up there selling it. That's a dysfunctional family. That's not normal. You gotta blame somebody for this. Parents, they want to say, well, you know, you ask them, where's your child? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Did, did, you, did you cook for him? Him or her, did you cook for him? Well, they'll find something to eat. We don't sit down at the table anymore together and eat dinner. We don't read together. We don't, we don't talk about the Lord ever. It ain't nothing but a bunch of fighting and fussing and complaining. Lack of all kinds. People don't want to work anymore. They'd rather, they'd rather come to a church and, and take whatever food and clothes you can give them and you never see them again. That's dysfunctional. The answer is simple. It's so simple that people don't get it. It's because they've never experienced what I'm about to tell you. Dysfunctional families can be helped but you got to want help. The answer, of course, is Jesus Christ. And why is Jesus Christ the answer? Because, and I'll tell you this, and, and the only way that you can get what I'm about to tell you about here is by experiencing it yourself. But if you have a good relationship with God, you will experience. And I'm not talking about the kind of love that you get out here on the streets from your buddies. Or even the kind of love that you get from your wife. Or your best friend. Or an uncle that you trust. Or an aunt. I'm talking about a different kind of love. The book calls it an agape love. It's kind of a funny word, agape. It just means a godly love. I saw a movie, I, I, I wish I knew the name of it right now because I recommend this movie and it, it will be on the screen. My wife and I watched a movie several times. It's about a firefighter. And him and his wife are going through some hard times. She won't speak to him. He won't speak to her. He's got a problem with pornographic stuff on the internet. He's saving up his money from being a firefighter to buy a very, very luxurious, expensive boat that he always wanted. And she hates him. 
She's, they've grown apart. They're dysfunctional. And all of a sudden, this guy's dad says, look, I want you to do this. And it's 40 days of different things that he needs to do. And it's Christian, it's a list of things. Once a day, you buy your, your wife flowers. And maybe the next day, uh, the only thing on the list is, is to find one thing about her and, and praise her for it. The next day, maybe spend one hour praying for her. And it's, it goes on for 40 days like this. And this guy is not a Christian. Neither one of them are. And as he goes through this list, he keeps turning to his father for help and advice. And the longer he goes, the worse things seem to get. Until one day, his dad takes him to a park where there's a cross in the park. And the guy's complaining to his dad. He says, she don't respect me. She spits on me. She won't listen to me. She won't pay attention to me. No matter what I do, it's not good enough. And the father is leaning up against the cross. And he says to his son, that's the same thing you have been doing to Jesus Christ. All these years, you've done nothing except think about yourself. And he has an epiphany. And you can tell, even in the movie, that the actor was moved. And he breaks out, and he has these tears running down his face. It's because he found God at that moment. And he experienced love and forgiveness. And all of a sudden, all the years that he had heard about Jesus and all the stuff that he had been through in his life came to a head. And he got it. He got it. He understood. Now he had been going through this 40 day thing kind of eh, halfway. If it said buy her flowers, instead of buying her roses, he buy her daisies. Instead of praying for her for an hour, he'd say, eh, pray for my wife today. 15 seconds. And he wasn't giving it at all. And that's the same way he approached his marriage. He wasn't giving it at all. But as soon as he started, I mean, he's about halfway down on the list by now. And as soon as he started giving his all, his wife noticed a change in the man. Now, get she's not a Christian either. But she noticed the change in him. And she finally says to the guy, something has happened to you. Something's happened to you. And I don't know what it is, that's happened to you, but whatever you've got, I want it to. I want it to. And so the man starts telling her 
about everything that he had done. And by the end of the movie, these two found love. When you say, I found Jesus, it means the same thing as saying, I found love. You can say, I found love, or you can say, I found Jesus. They are one and the same. But unless you know Jesus Christ and you have experienced that kind of love, you don't know what love is. I'm telling you. You say, well, I love so-and-so. And she loves me. I know she does. Not like this. I'm talking about a love that when it hits you, it feels like you've been struck by lightning. And all of a sudden, the lights and bells and whistles come on. And you get it. And it changes your life forever and ever and ever. And you can never go back. And then you have the strength to tell people to butt out. You have the strength to every day do for your spouse with her or his best interest in mind because you actually know now what love is. I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not kidding you a bit when I say this. I've been in some bad relationships. But there has not been a day that I can remember ever that her and I have ever disagreed or had, a, had an argument over. Never. They said, well, that's not normal. That's weird. It's every couple fights. Who says? Well, my psychologist and my psychiatrist says that it's good for y'all to have a good fight every now and then. No, it's not. Stop listening to your psychiatrist and start listening to Christ. And you can avoid dysfunctionalism. What if you think that your life is beyond hope? What if you're out there and you're thinking, I'm too old. I've gone way too far down this road. There's, there's no help for me. Even if I get help, where do I go from here? Man, have faith. Stop listening to the other voice in your head that tells you you can't. And there's no hope. I've been broke all my life and I'll never ever have any money. That's not true. Say my wife hates me. We haven't spoke to each other in 10 years. Through Christ, all things are possible. And once you feel this love I've been trying to explain to you about, you're going to know what I mean. All you got to do is pick up the phone and say, I am willing. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to do because I want this to work. I'm tired of being the dysfunctional parent to my children. I'm tired of letting people walk all over my life. I know it's wrong, but I can't stop myself. I even find myself agreeing with them. We can talk about this, and we'll pray about 
this. And I'm telling you, there is hope for all situations. This is a guy who created the universe. The universe out of nothing. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's just waiting for you to say, Hey, Father, forgive me. I repent. Would you take me back? Would you save me? Will you have me? Instead of making excuses like they did back in Genesis. Dysfunctional families ain't nothing, nothing to laugh about. Laugh over course of course, I think I've seen. But when it comes right down to it, it's no laughing matter. You got, you got kids right here in Ozark County who graduate from high school, can't even read or write. And the parents don't help them because they detach themselves from their children. They don't care whether the kids can read or write. That's dysfunctional. You got kids out there, 12 years old, having babies. And mom and dad think that's great. Well, I got pregnant when I was 12. Well, you made a mistake and now you're saying it's okay for her to do it? Think about it. How many families do you know of that are not dysfunctional? I'm still asking the question. How many? Not very darn many. But it's time that we got back to Christ. You'll find yourself a lot happier, full of hope, and you'll see God do a miracle in your life. And you'll experience this agape love, man. There ain't nothing like it. And peace. And you'll want to take responsibility. That's the biggest problem here. People don't want to take responsibility for nothing. Nothing's ever our fault anymore. Just like back in Genesis. Nothing was their fault. I'll pass them up to somebody else. And let them figure it out. Take responsibility. Come to God. Admit that you did wrong. Admit that you could be a better husband or a wife or a parent. Admit. And by the grace of God and by His love, your life's about to take a great big leap forward. Glory. Glory to God. And if you're one of these, I'm going to close with this. If you're one of these guys that think you're the boss of the house, you rule over your wife, and what you say goes, and you point and snap your fingers and expect her to jump. Put yourself in her shoes. Put yourself in her shoes. The woman that you married, that you wooed. Hatred. Is a horrible thing. Pride is another hateful thing of the devil. Hate, pride, mostly pride. I rule over my house. I am the king of my kingdom. That's a lie. 
That's not the way it's supposed to be. You are equal. She has worth. She's the same as you. Talk to her. Love her. Give her your honor and respect. And I'll tell you what. You're going to be a lot happier. Your children are going to be happier. Your spouse is going to be a lot happier. And you're going to know that you're saved and you're going to heaven. And that Christ is with you and loves you and cares about you. And things are going to take a great big leap forward. And you've got something to look forward to for once. I don't care what the problem is. God can do all things. Try it. I believe I've done what God asked me to do today. I pray that you'll call this number on the screen. I pray that you will become a part of this church. I pray that you will support us. If you are led by the Holy Spirit and you want to send a financial gift, it will be put to good use. We will make you a part of this church. We will love you. We will not gossip about you. And we will treat you as brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers because that's what you are to us. You'll learn to love everybody because you are so full of God that you can't help but to love everybody.